So, Mike, thanks for joining me today on the Mark and Me podcast. My absolute pleasure, Mark. Thanks for having me. As you know, Mike, now you are the final member of Empire State Bastard to come on the podcast. All four are in place. It feels like an Infinity Stone on a gauntlet or a, a Panini <laughs> sticker album, but uh, you are the final piece to the puzzle. You've completed it. You've completed Empire State Bastard. What do I do now? Do I give up? Do I retire? I don't know. Maybe uh, what other sort of heavy metal supergroup can you go after? Nail Bomb? They split up, right? Um, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. But what yeah. I love to do with all guests that come on the show, uh, I've had Anthony Hopkins, Mads Mickelson, Kevin Smith, uh, Audrey wow. Plaza, all different people from all different walks of life, but they always get the first same question. And what I'm really intrigued with with you, Mike, is when you were growing up, can you remember that first album that you may have bought or was given <laughs> that made you fucking love music? Well, first of all, I, and, and I, I'd forgotten about this until relatively recently, and it was my mum that reminded me that the first vinyl record that I got, that I requested, yeah, was, so quite old, it was in 1981, and it was the vinyl 12-inch full album of the royal wedding between Charles and Diana. <laughs> fuck i've done now, 330 this... episodes and no one said that no i should fucking hope not <laughs> and i i remember because i just i just loved the picture on the on the cover and i think i was sort of mildly obsessed with princess Di back then because you know she was like a pop star in a yeah. way you know she was everywhere and i was like i was really struck with her at you know five years old four years old whatever and uh so I decided that I had to have this big picture, not realizing that it was a record. And the record was of course, deathly boring. Um, so that was it, that, uh, uh, but the first album that fucking absolutely changed everything beyond all recognition will have been Paranoid by Black Sabbath because wow. um, I remember, well, I, I was in the status quo. My, I had an older brother, he was like four years older than me and he was into the heavy stuff, you know, and I kind of wanted to be cool and rebellious like him. Um, so him and all his mates were in States Quo. States Quo, you've got to remember, in like 1982 to 1985 were the biggest rock band in the country. They were fucking huge. People forget that. They, and they were cool. There's no two ways about it. That they, they were the shit. So I got into them at like age seven, but I didn't actually have a favorite Quo album. I just liked Quo. Yeah. Um, and then Live Aid was on and Black Sabbath played. And I'd already, I already liked Ozzy. I thought he was fucking badass. But then, so I, you know, I'd had a couple of Ozzy records and I loved it, but I never checked out this Black Sabbath thing. And then suddenly uh, my cousin, April, she I was like, oh, I've got a Black Sabbath record. So she taped me paranoid and that was it for, for my birthday. Then I got a box set of the first six Black Sabbath albums. And when you've got that in your life, and t fucking last night I listened to Black Sabbath. You know, I I don't I don't tire of them. Again, it's kind of like a happy place, a comfort comfort. Them they're my comfort viewing. I just fucking adore them so much. Um, I don't know what it is. It's maybe the sort of friction between them. Those records have got a lot of mistakes on. They're a bit ropey. Um, you can tell they were made quite quickly, but it's a band at the absolute height of their powers. And that kind of set me up to, to do everything really. Um, that it was just a band that I just kept returning to and reeling myself back to my roots and going, this is still the best, you know? Um, and I was only, I guess like seven when I got into Aussie and then nine when I got those Black Sabbath albums. I mean, some of the best foundations ever that are still with you now and, um, yeah. I was lucky enough to see Cancer Bats doing um, Bat Sabbath. Yeah, I heard they've been doing that. Fuck up. It's, I, it's, I love it's it. fucking great. If you get a chance to see it at any festival or anything, it, it works. Um, well, just after lockdown, um, I was in, living in Todmorden at the time, and there's this incredible pub over the road called the Golden Lion, which is the greatest pub on the planet. And I always having crazy like psychedelic music on. It's really great. Um, so for the uh, 50th anniversary of Paranoid, 
uh, I formed a, a little trio and we just played that whole album front to back. Fucking. And the thing is as well, we, we did rehearse it, but we realized we didn't need to rehearse it because we knew it like the back of our hands, that record, it's just so perfect. It's so it's fucking bone dry. And, uh, I, I just, and, and every time I hear it, I, I hear something, some little discrepancy that I didn't notice before. Um, just, you know, Ozzy's voice is so dark and scared sounding, but he's sort of dripping with this fucking menace. It's so unique. Um, yeah, I just, they're up there with the Beatles for me. It's, you know, yeah. and I'm a huge Beatles fan. Um, I just, I just love them so much. But yeah. There you go. What about live music? Because it changes, doesn't it, when you go and see a band live for the first time? Uh, I don't know if Black Sabbath were one of your first early ones, but can you remember maybe your first gig that blew your mind <laughs> and made you think, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Yeah, well, I, in 1984, uh, my ma and dad took me to see Status Quo. Oh, wow. And uh, it was fucking pulverizingly loud. I was I was too young to, to, to be able to handle it, quite honestly. And I was up on the balcony. I remember my brother just fucking headbanging. And I was like, you know, just a little bit spooked out. It was a bit too much for me. Um, but, I th- I, you know, I, I just remember seeing... I was really taking Rick Parfit. Um, he just always seemed to be playing so fucking hard. His his picking hand was so heavy, and and uh, he was always just pouring with sweat with this incredible mane of blonde hair. And I was just like, I want to be that guy, you know. Just and, and as, as a matter of fact, that was Status Quo's final, well, su- supposedly farewell tour in 1984. And then I went to see that they reformed the original lineup in 2014, maybe. And I went to see them with my brother again. And they were every bit as fucking loud as I remember them being. It was like, holy shit. Again, we were on the balcony. It was like, it is so fucking loud in here, man. You know, it's just brilliant. Absolutely magical band. You know, their their 70s output, the live album is just fucking dynamite. I love it. So is guitar your kind of first instrument you picked up from watching bands like Sabbath and uh, yeah. Stax Pro and stuff? Were you like, I just want to play guitar and be like those guys? Yeah, I wasn't a very um, sociable kid. I wasn't very, um, I, I, I was like fucking sooty. I would just like tap my mum on the shoulder and whisper in her ear. I would, I would never talk to anyone. Um, but the guitar, I think they realised quite quite quickly, my folks, that I, that it, it was legit. It wasn't just going to be another fad like I was getting into fucking skateboarding or something. Yeah, I think they could tell that, you know, I just wanted to do that. And that, so they, they got me like a, a a really cheap piece of shit, 25 quid K guitar, right? I'm left-handed, but I was playing right-handed guitars for a while. And, uh, and I think, yeah, because I was just, that's all I did. It was just in my room learning black sabbath songs just on my own on one string and and i think they realize yes he seems really fucking into this thing you know that's amazing because a lot of people i mean were you turning around at that point to your parents saying i want to be a rock star i want to be well probably i don't really remember i i think that i think that they were probably encouraging that kind of chat anyway it's like you know that's great some parents would be like son you need to get a real job Stop not at all not at all when i left university uh because i've been studying music I, I left uni and then just in order to you know pay rent i had to start working in a fucking bank and doing all these shitty jobs and my mother was mortified it's like what the fuck are you doing you know you've got to get out of there you know and but it was like well i didn't just didn't know where to look i didn't know i didn't have that kind of infrastructure that i could you know just seek out at the drop of a hat you know that that came after really so did you do the whole thing during college and school of like you know the bands like a covers band or an original band that was doing the battle of the bands route and all the usual stuff that most people do all that shit i um when i was at college well when i was at when i was at school i ended up joining a band with a couple of dudes who were like 10 12 years older than me because when i was sort of 12 13 there was nobody nobody played nobody was into anything i was nobody was into metal that's for sure so um i not only did i not have any friends i certainly didn't have anybody i could play with um everybody's football and fucking fucking rugby and 
wet, 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 and shit like yeah. that. You know? <laughs> so I wet, wet, wet. Quite bizarrely, um, I'd done work experience at a guitar shop in Leeds, and the week after I'd um, I'd been there, these two guys from a band who'd been signed to RCA, you know, they'd had a shit experience in the industry. They decided they were going to form a new band. And they walk into this shop in Leeds, saying to the guy, we're looking for a guitar player. Can you recommend anyone? It's like, best thing we've seen is this fucking 13 year old kid who was working here last year. It was fucking brilliant. So they auditioned me, took me down their basement, played a couple of fucking Dave Lee Roth numbers. And I was in a band. That's um, and so that was it. But it, that that fell apart quite quick and then I, I i did covers bands um just for the experience i used to love it you know going out again playing van halen and fucking just any you know top top 20 rock and roll heavy metal numbers and then i went to uni and formed my own band and when i went to uni that's when i decided to tell everybody i were a singer because I then I, I was never a singer. I just I was like a a, a closet singer. I would just I, only I would know because I'm from quite a cynical place, Mark. And you can't if you come out and just start telling everybody you're a singer, then that's a step too far. You probably yeah. you probably need taking down a peg or two. But um, when I moved to Manchester, I just started telling everybody that I was a singer, and so I, I joined loads of bands. Did you find it quite hard because if you were this sort of sooty character as a kid and you know didn't have lots of friends and stuff to become a singer and a front man were you like oh fuck like i'm gonna have to really try and get some extra confidence or wear a mask to try and look yeah. like i'm into this right now yeah i think i wasn't necessarily a very nice person at school because because i had long hair and all that i was kind of made to feel like an outcast so i thought well if i'm going to be made to feel like an outcast i'll behave like a fucking outcast and so i just decided everybody was full of shit and nobody fucking gets what what i'm into so i've got no nothing here you know yeah and then when i went to uh, college i found loads of people who were exactly like me and into all exactly the same stuff so i went too far the other way got You're to like, where have you been all my life and exactly yeah and i just <laughs> I, I i was too too distracted and too excitable and too giddy and then I, th I kind of settled down when i got to uni and then again studying music and and just met the people who would be in my band and in my life to this day really that's awesome and i suppose was that the bit when it became a reality that maybe you could take a a, a kind of a road to make this a career and a job that you wouldn't then have to go and work in a fucking bank and all the other shit well i would i was doing i left uni and I, I i did a few sort of really shitty jobs that every single one of them i got fired from because as hard as i tried i was a no good at the job yeah but b they could tell that my heart was not in it and that i didn't actually give a fuck no matter how hard i tried to exude this air of dedication and responsibility they knew that i hated the job they could see the and, fakeness and that i was desperate to get out yeah so it, it during that time i formed ocean size uh with some of the lads from uni and college and you know i did a, a couple of years maybe i was on the dole as well as as, as doing ocean size and then we got signed um yeah. after about four years of, of, of going at it you know uh, but I, I, you know, there was never any choice. I was uh, one way or the other, it was going to happen. I just, I was very lucky that I got into a band that was that fucking good because I didn't necessarily come in and go, da da, I'm the star of the show. I know how to do everything. We're going to play my songs. That's not what happened at all. The we wrote the songs between us. I didn't have the, the confidence or all the ability to write a song. Um, at, that would have been any good at that point so i was fortunate that the rest of the band was so fucking unbelievably talented um that we were able to make stuff that i think still stands up really it does it's unbelievable thank you <clears throat> did you have any expectations or kind of like um i don't want to say targets because that sounds like a fucking corporate word but like realistic goals as a band because you guys blew up i remember there was this when i was at uni there was ocean size 
Vex Red, My mm-hmm. Vitriol. But there was these group of bands that I would see, Idlewild, Hell is for Heroes, 100 Reasons. And there's this really influx of great bands all coming through, Aerogram, Biffy Clyro. Mm. And it was just a great time. Yeah. And I remember going in and queuing up for your album and just being like, it's such a fucking great time for British music. It was. There was quite the scene going on at, at that point, you know, um, and spearheaded to my mind by Biffy, who were very much the sort of dark horse of the scene um, because everybody loved them, but no one could have imagined how far they'd go. Yeah. I remember, you know, getting Vertigo of Bliss before it came out because we shared, we shared a producer and I was like, holy fuck, this record is a masterpiece, but it's a shame it's never going to catch on. This is too good for the masses. They won't, they won't take to it. And then I saw them play about a month later and the place was going fucking bananas. I was like, wow, I've really underestimated the fucking, the, the musical taste of, of, of an entire fucking generation here, because this is really catching on. And I was like, fuck man, maybe there is hope for us all, you know, uh, but ocean size, we didn't really, I guess in terms of ambition, we just, we, you know, we wanted to get to the point where, you know, maybe we could headline the London Astoria. Yeah. Um, which would have been like 1,800 people. We never got that big. Um, uh, yeah. But it was just to sustain, you know, like my sort of inbuilt, uh, despondent nature meant that when we got signed, I was like, well, this ain't going to last. They're going to they're gonna realise we can't write any fucking songs and then we're going to get dropped. And, you know, they really, Beggar's Banquet really threw a lot of money at this, um, uh and it took, you know, it, it it went okay. We we plateaued quite quickly, but we were able to make a living out of it for for a good long while there. Um, I always look at you guys and uh, Ruben as kind of those bands that a million dead. Those three bands that should have been bigger if it had been a different time, maybe five mm-hmm. years later, or even now, yeah. it would be a different story because of streaming and every fucker in the world being able to access your music. But I feel like you were always on this uphill battle. And I, I always remember watching early Ruben gigs and you guys and thinking, why is this not busier? Why is this not mm-hmm. a fucking academy instead of a small academy number two? You know what I mean? It's Yeah, I know. I, I think that it's, it's, sometimes the stars just don't align. And, you know, in a lot of respects, I I, I know what it means to, to have more pressure on you. And I, you know the ocean size days by the, by the third album, I realized that I, I really loved it and, and, and I loved it too much. And it, it, it was quite not a crutch, but it was an obsession and it was starting to sort of consume me yeah. that like that I, I just wanted, I, I, I utilized every minute of every day thinking about the band, what we could do with the band, what we, how, what we should be doing, what we could do. And slowly but surely it started to drive me fucking insane that I was so distracted. I couldn't have a regular conversation because all I could think about was the band. I, I just loved it too much. Um, and I realize now, you know, playing for Biffy as I have been doing for, wow, 14 years now. Is it that um, long? Fucking hell. It is long. Um, that that kind of pressure cooker thing uh i'm not i'm really not made for that um i i i I get to i get the best of both worlds i get to just fucking play the gigs have a great time but not have to worry about the major decisions because quite honestly i'm not really certain of anything in my life I (laughs) i don't know the answer to anything um and i'd much rather somebody else make the big important decisions because shit goes wrong all the way up. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that I feel that ocean size and, and, and similarly what I, what I do now is exactly the kind of level that I could handle. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do, do you, and I know I see it on your Instagram sometimes comments and you've you know, talked about a re-release of vinyl and stuff like that. People are obsessed with, having those classic albums again and not paying eBay prices. Hmm. Have you ever had the conversation with the guys about doing a, cause there's obviously anniversaries and stuff. You see bands that are reforming now and coming back and doing 
anniversary shows is there anything in the works or could there be or is it that's a closed book and you're happy with the end the, re- the records are uh, coming back in print yeah um, we just signed the second two albums to k scope so some of that's going to start coming out nice. um i'm not actually allowed to say when the first thing's coming out i've just discovered so i better yep that tight um but yeah k scope are all about doing big elaborate reissues so frames and self-preserved records will come out with hopefully a bunch of extra stuff i know specifically the the last ocean size record there's a fucking mountain of stuff so hopefully that'll all come out um yeah but in terms of gigs uh i'd 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 be up for it i think that you know in a moss i think it's easy to look at the, these things pragmatically and say that well no the money isn't there and obviously i wouldn't really i can't afford to do anything for free especially no. last year um but i think that ocean size is something it being being as i was essentially the poetry of the band yeah. you know i wrote the words it's kind of in my nature to want this ever so slightly romanticize bow on top of the package where we go well we've earned a fucking lap of honor let's do it and let's all be mates again because we're not really mates a lot of right. the, the, the band split into two factions and one side fucking hates the other um there's been you know you know with, without going too deep into it mark the, the the end of that band was absolutely the most traumatic thing i've ever fucking been through and i've been through some right shit i kind of wanted to avoid that because i don't want to bring back fucking scars for you it's not fair it, no, I'm, yeah, I'm quite over it now I'm yeah quite over it. it took a long time it was yeah. really really awful and i think that yeah in an ideal world it'd be easy to go Fuck it let's just go do it and and we'll make it we'll make good on on what went wrong uh truth is um steve de rose is retired he, yeah. he just got worn down uh he just had enough of shitty touring conditions and living like a fucking <laughs> i don't know it's not it's not fun at that level it, it's no. very hard you know nutritionally uh sleeping conditions all this stuff it's fucking grim um and i think i don't know about mark heron i don't i think i'm hearing that he's retired as well but don't quote me on that i wouldn't want to speak for him um but i don't hear from him and no. yeah it's, it's probably it's sad isn't it when you you talk so highly about how much it meant that it kind of made you go a bit insane with how obsessed you were in this love yeah. and absolute well, I, just, I just needed it to work i need i wanted it to i wanted us to be the best and i knew that we were fucking special the pro i guess Part of the problem, Mark, is that as we got more incrementally, you know, we got signed. Yeah. I thought that that would cure a lot of our confidence issues. It didn't. Um, we suddenly came into a bunch of fucking money, and I thought that would. Uh, we sold a song to a uh, fucking to Orange Mobile Phones. They they bought the rights to a song, well, yeah. you know, to use on an advertising campaign, and that fucking brought in an absolute fortune. And I thought that that would cure our ills, that we could all just be proud of each other and go, we fucking made it. We're okay. We're going to be all right. It didn't. It just got worse and worse and worse. So that it, it was just this perpetual thing of how to make it fucking work. And by that last album, it's recognizing it is never going to work. You know, it doesn't yeah. matter. And it's like how how much more successful you could possibly be knowing this will always be a problem it uh, must be really fucking tough man to know that i don't know like you just can't make it any better even though you want to no I, I, and this is it it's like I, i'm sure that I, I wasn't necessarily the easiest person to get along with that i've got quite a temper i can be quite stubborn but i still really give a fuck what my friends think about me and other people in that band didn't give a fuck they just no. it, it was like psychological battery it's like i used to think that like i used to think that narcissism was 
just some do you like looking at themselves in the mirror and, and thinking you're fucking gorgeous. It's a far more insidious and sinister and fucking evil condition. And 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 that's why this band yeah. is not together anymore. <laughs> so I think that's enough to know that it wouldn't work and maybe just let it be that and not try and make yeah. anything more. And, and, you know, I'll, I'll say Arc Tangent uh, are the people who, who keep coming in and, and offering money for us to reform um and frankly there that's the only place that could hold a sufficient welcome for us you know i, I can see it as well they've just announced mogwai on the poster and this yeah, year and but, i just thought know, God, i can imagine you there in the middle of that headline on a saturday oh, fuck no well, the festival would do that for us so um it's just at this point it's uh there's not enough money. <laughs> now I've done Empire State it. Bastard. Should I do all of you guys individually and then put yeah. them all back together? Hey, like do this? it, man. That can be you my know. next project. <laughs> I'll just take 5%. That's fair. And yeah, that, hey, that's, that, that's a good finder's fee, man. <laughs> Off he goes into the sunset. So that all ends. And I, did, I didn't realize, I've, I've, I have told Simon, Biffy Clyde is the band I've seen the most. I've seen you... 61 times now in concert Fucking hell man yeah oh it's God. i was there when you know the the very first ep i've still got it on cd i saw marmaduke duke i've seen them supporting headers for heroes for free quid in london i've been to wow. all the unplugged everything so i've must have seen you for at least half of that if you joined you know that long ago and um I never know the story. I've never asked Simon. I never know the story about how it actually became. Do you just want to join the band and play live and have fucking the time of your life all around the world? It's, this this has been quite a constant in my life, and this is one of the first times I realised that this is what you've got to do. If you want something and you think you can do it, just fucking ask. Yeah, it'll probably work out. So in 2007, I, you know, I was, I'd been mates with them for like five years at that point. You know, we were signed to Beggars together. We toured together, fucking partied a lot together. I loved them so much that I just, I, I felt like they made me a better person. They made me the person that I wanted to be because they're just such fucking good crack. Yeah. Great chat. They're not, yeah, when I say they're not cool, I mean I mean that in the best way possible. They're not trying to be. They're not like being Hollywood, are they? They're not. No, these and they're not trying to be stars. pop stars. There's no bullshit about them. They're just we fucking dafties, and I love yeah. them. So I guess it was like Puzzle was just coming out. It was in the bag, and I loved that. It, it, but it wasn't out. And I just I'd read an interview where Simon was saying. Yeah, we're thinking, you know, if it if it gets big enough, we'll probably take on another guitar player. I was like, what? Now, I was like, I didn't want them to get another guitar player because what one of the many things that I loved about them is that they were a three-piece. That's what it was. It was how That's does Simon sing and play stuff like fucking Jaggedy Snake on his own? Yeah, like, and, fucking hell. And they sounded fucking enormous. I didn't want that to happen either, but I was like, well, if they're going to get another guitarist... It's fucking gonna be me, and I don't. And if I see them on stage with somebody else, I'm go, I'm not gonna like it. No. So I just emailed them saying, "If you're gonna do this, then please consider me, because nobody's gonna do it better than than I do. I know this fucking band inside out, and I'll do it fucking right. Don't you worry about that." And then that was 2007. I did, I did a few things with them, like little guest spots, playing on the odd song here and there. And then that was like Leeds and Reading and fucking uh, Tea in the Park, stuff like that. And then sure enough, 2009, I got the call and I started in April 2010. What's and it, it came like at that? the fucking right time because Ocean Size was really, it was really getting so, so difficult. Uh, so I just, I needed that in my life to just keep me fucking sane. And uh, it's been magical. I just, all I did was ask and it it came true <laughs> it's it's a funny one i can't compare it that i'll now get a 14 year career and a touring band that are now one of the biggest bands in the world but when i saw simon at um 2000 trees this year he's always been the one guest i've wanted for like the podcast i've had a list mm. of all my favorite people he's always the number one but i wanted it to be the right time mm. and i just asked him i just walked up and said look 
I'm a fucking huge fan. I'm not a fanboy. I'm a huge fan. And I do a podcast. I've had all these bands on Incubus and this band and that band. And I just want you to come on for episode 300. And he was like, I'd fucking love to. And I was like, oh, I thought I had to go through every agent and manager and PR manager. And he was just like, it'd be a fucking honor. And I was like, there we go. It was that simple. Yeah. And I think that, you know, mag- th- 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 there's a real magical thing happening at 2000 Trees and Arc Tangent that, particularly 2000 Trees, where it's, it, as we were driving in, I said, you do realize that this is fucking Biffy Fest. You yeah. Know, everybody here has got fucking time for you, you know, and I think, and sure enough, the fucking, the little chaps on the door all day did not stop. Everybody just wanted to say hello to Sai and just fucking people that he'd not seen in years and years and years. It was, it was great for him. He fucking, he really loved it. So I think that just having that, you know, thing of I can go up and say hello to Simon, I yeah. think it's, it's great for him and it's great for everybody, you know. So obviously we, there's no point in talking about all your years in Biffy because it's just an absolute dream, isn't it? If I said to you, you'll be doing the unplugged set all across the world and playing in Paris and headlining download and all, it, it must have been like you, you would never have even imagined that, never mind dreaming it. No, I, um, look, man, like fucking my dreams have come true several times with this band, you know, partic- I, I always – my favorite festival on on the planet is Glastonbury, and, and the day we played that, I guess it was it Saturday night or sun, Sunday, and we were on before Ed Sheeran was headlining, but I don't count that at all. No. Um, and we, uh, you know, just looking out and knowing the things that I've seen in that field and the 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 drugs that I've taken and the good times that I've had just in that fucking field and seeing right to the back, right to where the tents are. There's, the place is absolutely fucking packed. It was a gloriously sunny day. And I was just like, this is it. This yeah. is this is just it now. Um, and it wasn't until, I guess, ESB came along that I was like, wow, you know, there are other dreams left to dream. Because I was like, I've, I've fucking done all of it. Um, it's quite tough to to think of new shit. <laughs> I was going to say, like, how do you top that? But then Empire State Bastard is such a more personal project for you, isn't it? It's it's not you got asked to join. It's your baby. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd sort of... Well, me and Simon had always had hankerings to make our own thing and, and it be our fucking dream metal band that nobody had ever made before. It's like, and it was like, one day we'll do it. But it took over a decade. And so when I finally got my ass in gear and made the right stuff, made the put the right ingredients together to make the right fucking soup, and Simon was like, oh, thank fuck. This is it. This is it. I, I get it. Let's go. And then, of course, um, you know, as I was saying before, you know, it's like, who are we going to get to play drums? You know, <laughs> I <Just> pro- ask. <laughs> I'd, I'd programmed it all to sound like Dave Lombardo. I was like, who do we know who plays like Dave Lombardo? Let's just fucking ask him. Yep. And uh, that's just the way of the world. You know, people call it nepotism, but it's not really nepotism if you don't know the guy. <laughs> Never bravery. <laughs> Pure bravery and having the balls, I think. <laughs> surely when you hit that send because you emailed him didn't you uh, yeah. for his wife and she goes through it and filters it out because i'm sure he gets a lot of crap he does uh, i think I she said it. to him i think he told me you need to listen to this one like i know you're busy i know you got mr bungle you got this you got that you're fucking mentally busy but this one deserves your time and like <laughs> just to get through that golden gate must have been like he's fucking listened i know it was ugh. i still can't believe it um you know I, we were texting each other yesterday. Um, it's it's hard, you know. This, I, I'm sure you won't mind me saying because obviously, you know, Dave's a renowned fucking good soul. I think everybody knows anything about him, and the the he's a sort of centrifugal force for fucking good vibes. And you've only got to look at his social media. Yeah, any story about him, everybody fucking is just willing him to be great 
and everybody, if if he does something that people are like, yeah, I'm not feeling this one, Dave, they'll probably be, fu- it's like, well, it doesn't matter. He'll have another record out fucking in six months and it'll be yeah. great. He's just a fucking good dude. When we were on the bus, I was just, you know, it was in the middle of the night. We were all having a few beers and stuff. And we were on our way to Birmingham and Dave's on the phone and he's going, Mike, 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 Mike. And he shows me his phone and he's talking to fucking Bill Ward. (laughs) And my fucking blood ran cold. I was just like, there's going to be a fucking black hole in a minute. This is too, I can't, my head was just breaking in two, like, and I could just hear Bill on the phone. I'm like, no way, no fucking way is this happening. Um, but yeah, just a fucking, you know, it's one of those things. You, you can be really, 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 really good. But if you're a fucking arsehole, you won't get the gigs. No. Nobody will want to be in a band with you. And, um, you know, you can read into that whatever you want. But Dave's just fucking... It's just the perfect fucking gent. He's an example to us all. He really is. He he carries himself so well on social media. His projects he's in, he never says anything bad about the past, even though other band no. members he's worked with are all just arseholes and slagging people off, and he just keeps mm-hmm. himself pure from it. Yeah. And I love the fact zen. that... I love the fact he kind of is doing it because he wants to. Yeah. It's not oh, yeah. For, he doesn't need the money. He's not like. I love that he's, he's like a, he's a meme now. The, his quote in the Dave Grohl movie where he just goes, no, never give up. <laughs> never give up. And I'm like, fuck, I want that tattooed. I want a picture of Dave's face saying that tattoo. Get him to Chris write it. On the back of my hand. My, that's a good, fuck, I'm going to do that, man. Mate, I've got <laughs> Simon's writing on my arm because I was like. I mean, what was one of the lyrics? I literally just got him to sign my arm because I just thought his oh. signature is fucking great because it's just nice. I am. Uh... I'm sure that's a uh, Satanist thing, writing your name backwards. I'm sure that's... I know, and it's S Mark as well. It's like devil. Satan, you know. <laughs> but um, what was interesting about you guys is I had no idea what you guys were going to be like. So the name had been going around for a while. It Then I think some news outlets and you signed to Roadrunner mm. and people were starting to say there's a song. I, th- I think it was Daniel Picard to play your first song. And then you were playing download. And I remember going into the tent thinking, is this going to be like a Biffy band? Is it going to be Ocean Size? Is it going to be Slayer? Is it going to be some fucking proggy random shit? Like what is going to go on when all these minds and personalities and musicianship gels? And I don't believe even at that gig then you all knew exactly what was going to happen because it felt like, the start of something fucking special, but the transition that I saw from that to 2000 trees to art tangent was huge, dude. Like you all gel more each time. Yeah. I know obviously the other festivals, you had a different drummer, but then when I saw you in Birmingham with Naomi and everything, it was like a band that had been going 10 years. You were all fixed in watching (laughs) Naomi and Dave just fucking locked in as a rhythm section, you just in your own world, like I could have come up to you and told you you won the lottery. You wouldn't even look at me. You were just in your own place. And it was fucking magical to sit and watch dude. Like it was like, look how far they've come. And that's not saying the first gig was shit. It wasn't, but it was just, they found each other now and they know what this is. Yeah. I I think, well, I I really appreciate you saying that because it definitely felt like, you know, we, we were under rehearsed for a long time. I, I just thought, you know, we'll just show up, the songs go how they go, and we'll just get it. But <laughs> it did quite work out like that. It was fucking fraught. But uh, specifically that Birmingham gig, that was the best we ever played. I don't know if yeah. it's necessarily the best gig for the audience, but I we all came away going, that is the benchmark of, of it's like now now we're a band. Yeah. Um, it just felt something clicked. I don't. I just yeah. watched you all, and there was no fuck ups. There was no no. We were there was, you that did night. it well, but it just it was like the perfect set. And I was like, how many main bands do you go and see where their headline slots like fifty minutes, you know? And it it flew by, and I was like, oh man, it just everything, the sound, everything, the PA, the vocals, it just all sounded fucking perfect. And I was like. Um, that was no, he, um, he, he, 
it it just felt sometimes it just feels fucking transcendental and there's yeah. certain moments where you're like i am in the greatest band of all time this is happening right now and i i really again you know i i in any given band, I feel like I am the most sentimental, the most, my, my nerves are sort of probably more raw than anybody's, but I always, and, and especially with Biffy, that I have time on stage to take it in. And I always make sure that I do, especially like at an outdoor show yeah, where you can just for a moment let everything go into slow-mo, be meditative with it, feel the fucking, the breeze blowing, just look out and just, just let everything freeze for a moment. And I'm, I'm quite, I really enjoy doing that every single night, to be honest. To just I bet it. some people don't, and I bet some bands are just so in the right, this is the motions. We're going to get in, sound check, go on stage, perform, like brilliant. Next one, yeah. you don't get that chance to step back and reflect, especially if you're, you know, front man. You got to remember every lyric and talk to the crowd. Yeah, between yeah. Songs, you I, know, I don't so. think Simon will mind me saying Simon is so in the moment. You know, he's just absolutely pinpoint precision. Yeah. Um, you know, he's just fucking on fire when he's on stage and I, sometimes I wonder if he just has a minute to, I guess he doesn't cause he's, he's playing and singing the whole yeah. fucking time. Whereas I'm not, I have plenty of chances. Well, that's beautiful. Like, it's like on your wedding out. day when you get to take a step back and see what's actually happening instead of uh, waiting for the photos. Oh, I, you know, every night I get to watch the band and, and fucking love it. It's great. Do you feel now pressure to, write the second album because for me and i've said this and it's it's documented on a podcast it was my album of the year last year and i, I oh, truly nice think nothing else i do a skip the end podcast which is a a big movies film and tv podcast and it's been very successful it's had like 18 million downloads but at the wow. end of the year we did a roundup of our films of the year and albums of the year and yours was mine i was like it's raw it's unpredictable it's melodic. There's very slight moments I can hear Biffy Clyro, but then <laughs> 10 seconds later, it's, we're not fucking Biffy Clyro at all. <laughs> and uh, it's angry and it's, it's fucking, I love it, dude. Like, I don't know where you're going to take it next. I just think, how the fuck do you now even start to go, right, we need to top this. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I was really hoping, thank you very much, by the way. No pressure, uh, by the way, as well. Like... <laughs> I was really open to have it in the bag yeah. by now. Um, various things have got in the way, but I, when I have tried to write some stuff, I'm very mindful of it sounding, to quote Lars Ulrich, stock. I don't want, I don't want it to sound like flat pack metal. Yeah, you know, fucking metal by numbers. Um, there's a few things. Naomi's sent some fucking brilliant stuff. She's writing as well. Um, just going to try a couple of different angles on this one. Um, yeah, we'll see what happens. I don't know either, but it, there's a lot of shit th being thrown at the wall. Um, there's a lot of stuff. We'll just see. And, and that's what happened last time in a lot of ways that I just sent so much fucking material to Simon, just so many, like, like five minutes of just fucking riff, 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 and just let him curate it. Yeah. Let him decide what, what dresses his voice well, you know, and what he would feel comfortable standing in the middle of the stage and fucking dishing up. It's kind of up to him. Um, it's exciting though. I mean, there's pressure, but at the same time, if it worked first time round, then just keep sending those ideas to Simon. Yeah, and... yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, it's it's a strange like you know you never want to repeat yourself, but with metal, it's dead easy to repeat yourself. Yeah. Um. So I I I, I don't. But want as musicians, that. all of you, and that's something that's in your blood, especially, and there's more than ever, Simon's. You don't play it safe you always evolve and even if you're doing metal you're going to evolve look at every album of biffy nothing sounds the same it really doesn't no it really doesn't i think um 
have to remind myself that this is kind of the fun part, Mark. You know, it's yeah. like the the sort of uh, tumultuous, sort of despondent terror of not knowing if anything's <laughs> any good. It, it just makes it taste so much better when you take it out of the oven and it's fucking brilliant, you know. Um, that's that's the reward. So I'll get there. We will get there. Um, everybody's all booked up at the moment anyway. But, yeah, hopefully it'd be nice to have some, some new things to jam on soon, you know. When you say you booked up, you've got a fucking huge tour with Sleep Token in America, which when Ooh. I saw that poster, I thought... Has some fan made that up? Like, that's fucking huge. Every time I look at that list of dates, it gets bigger. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. Um, It's going to be fucking amazing. I'm really... It's starting to become real now that I'm going to America for a month, to be honest. You know, every time I go to America, Mark, I kind of feel like make the most of this because you never know when you might never, ever get back here again. Um, you know, because touring America is so fucking expensive, it's absurd. Yeah, I don't know how anybody does it. Uh, never mind somebody who's signed to a fucking major label, as I am, unbelievably. Um, I I can't wait. It's going to be incredible. Um, Sleep Token, according to everybody I know, are fucking sound, sound dudes. So I can't wait to meet them. Uh, I guess have I won't. You seen them any selfies yet? with them? Say have, you, have you seen them live yet? I've or? never seen them. No. So I saw them in Birmingham uh, last year, which blows my mind because this morning I bought tickets to see them at Birmingham Arena. Wow. So in a year they've gone from the O2 Academy to the Arena. And, Fuck yeah. Uh, the pre-sales and I think... sold out in four minutes. So it's like, fuck me. Were they like an art tangent band as well? They used to play there. I think so, yeah. I think it's I mean, the third album that's just rocketed them, and now they've sold out America every day in minutes. I know. They've sold I mean, out. I've, I've I've heard the stats about what venues they could have done yeah. in America, and it's like it's fucking insane. But you know, I'm I'm just I'm I'm made up that a band from the Act Tangent scene essentially anybody who makes it from that is fucking all right by me, man. You know, yeah. So that's Act Tangent is. The perennial underdogs. Yeah. You know, it's a scene all unto itself. And look, but fortunately, it's a scene whereby when somebody does get successful, it's not going to, nobody's going to cry sell out. You know, um, everybody's just going to be like, fucking go, boys. That's awesome. I can't wait. And, and like I say, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to meet these lads. Um, They're going to, blow your mind live right it's so fucking well thought out and the production right. and Wembley Arena selling out in 10 minutes you know for 10,000 yeah. tickets like they're just getting bigger and bigger then I'll they're playing the O2 now it's like fuck yeah. me like Brilliant. future download headliner oh yeah dead easy man and and download needs a new headliner it just fucking does you know yeah I don't need to see Maiden again I mean, I need to see Maiden again. <laughs> Not again and again. I need it. I need, you know, this no, year's no, nice. Not again and again. <laughs> I'm a big Maiden fan for my it'll be, it'll be amazing, though, to go on stage every night and kind of you're getting that crowd won over. That, so everyone's bought a ticket for Sleep Token. There'll be some that have gone, you know, in America that have booked for you. But to hopefully get some people walking away going, fuck me, that band were great. I'm going to buy their vinyl on the way out or a t-shirt oh, or oh man um I, 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 I'm, again you know we were talking about there are no fucking dreams left to dream on this tour we're going to be playing uh radio city music hall and and That's red rocks awesome. and i'm like fuck man i never i just never thought i'd ever get the chance to do that um it's going to be magic um and there's a couple of double dates here there here and there so you know get to spend some time Toronto, Chicago, maybe I can't remember. Um, I can't need a guitar, do you need a guitar tech? Like that I actually do thing. need a guitar tech. <laughs> well, you said all I have to do is ask. <laughs> can Speak I come to, to America? Yeah. That would be amazing. <laughs> and I don't know how you do it, but as we're sitting here right now, you've even got a brand new solo album out. Uh, Forgiveness in the Grain. My Correct. brain is on it today and your vinyl sold out straight away which looked fucking sexy as hell you did another pressing and it sold yeah. out yeah. when the fuck do you ever sleep dude you know what i'm not nearly as prolific as everybody thinks i am i just i tend i i, I write a lot of stuff 
but a lot of it's crap, so I don't finish it. Um, so these are the only songs I've finished. There is a couple more, uh, two or three more that I'm, I need to finish off because I do want to release them. But um, no, I'm really, I'm really blessed, Mark, because like the the response has been fucking amazing. I've only had one bad comment. Somebody said it sounded like shit jazz, wow. which to me is a great compliment. That that's anybody say, that's can... not, that's not, I'd have that on a t-shirt. Shit yeah, jazz. Yeah, I know. Shit jazz. Fuck yeah, man. Cool. 10%. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, like, I, I, again, you know, I've not, I've probably got a reputation for being quite prickly because I've spent too much time on Twitter for a long time there. And that just turns you into a fucking moody prick. Try I, to I try and stay off it now. I saw... Yeah. Um... We're not going to go into this in detail, no. but I, I saw you getting very angry about, um, is it the Elvana troop, the Nirvana? <laughs> El- and I just thought... That's not where I thought this conversation was going. No, I'm, I'm not going down the, the fight and the abuse in the street. I'm not going down that. I'm going down the Nirvana tribute with Elvis. <laughs> oh. Um, yeah, it's it's a fucking breeding ground for just run you know, away from it. Just fucking stay off yeah, that platform. It, I, I'm, I'm out, man. Yeah. Uh, so, but, 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 yeah, everybody's been really lovely. Um, it's solo album's great, dude. Like fucking beautiful. Thanks. When I get paid, I'm getting the vinyl because it's. I like the newer one better than newer colors. Oh, send send us your address, Matt. I'll get you one. But you we've sure? not we've not gone pressed yet. They're gonna be. Like, I, I do like a pre order, so I don't. Yeah. I don't like order two thousand copies and only sell ten, and then <laughs> fucking can't move in the At those know. sleep token gigs on the little exactly. side. Exactly. Do you want? Do you want one of these? Did you like Empire State Bastard? Well, listen to the guitarist. Exactly. Yeah. You, you might like this. These tales of white male anguish. <laughs> Is it not on the streaming platforms? Is that a conscious choice? Was it more? I, I'm going to put Bandcamp it on and everything else. And... Yeah, it's good. It's on Bandcamp, and you can stream it from there. Yeah. But um, I I just I feel like if I'm putting it on streaming platforms straight away, then I'm giving it away for free. Of course. Yeah. And I can't afford to do that. I just, you know, I, I can't afford to work for free. You no, know, no, I get it. Um, not for any. You know, I, I, it's no great secret. I nearly fucking went bankrupt before. That's why I had to get this record out real fucking quick because I just, I just didn't have anything coming in. Um, but yeah, it's. I just stream platforms. I mean, I want it'll never be on Spotify. No, because I just don't agree with their policy on fucking anything. You'll get six p from the hundred thousand downloads. Like, oh great, yeah, cheers! I'll buy a chomp. The guy funding AI weapons and uh, and now refusing to pay anybody under a thousand streams, blah blah blah. That's blah, fucked blah. up. I couldn't believe I saw that the other day. All yeah. those bands that I love that have got 500 plays and they're so happy, and it's like you're not even going to get any money for that. Even your two yeah. quid, you're not getting. Yeah, and even fucking, you know, having paying millions for the Joe Rogan podcast so he can have absolute wankers like Alex Jones on and fucking what else you like. Really? Get your You'll fucking pay right. that guy, you know? I, I, yeah, I can't get on. I can't get on with it. So fuck Spotify. I'm not. I'm not going to do it for them. Well, the old school vinyl seems to be very popular, and everyone's loving that. So that can't. Yeah, be Yeah. Well, point. again, it's a romanticized thing. I feel like if it's not on vinyl, I've not really made it. Is that a cat right there, man? It's uh, my little dog Florence, who always gets in on every fucking oh, episode. Hey, we man. Oh bless. It's a girl. It's little. Girl, Florence. sorry, Florence. I thought you said Lawrence, not Florence. No, Florence. So she oh, comes on bless. every episode. It doesn't matter if it's been bloody Neil Marshall, um, <laughs> Neil Blomkamp. She always gets a little cameo. So I thought we'd done it then, but I just hello. Saw Decide that she wanted to come and say hello. Bless. Um, my final question for you today, and I ask this to everybody, um, it makes it quite fun for the podcast to keep it as original as I can, is you get to choose the very last song that's played. So as our interview's all edited and ready for the world to listen to on Spotify and Amazon oh, Music. Oh, fuck off. I can't press it onto vinyl. If I did, I would. But well, can't, So you, it, whatever song I pick's got to be on Spotify? No, no. It, oh. This podcast will be on Spotify. All right, okay. Don't worry about that. You can have any fucking song you want, but any song by any band in the world, one choice. All right, not just me. I've only I've done 327 interviews. Mm-hmm. One person picked their own music. That's it. Oh, well, I can't do that then. That's but from the used, he picked his own track. And I was like, fair play, he's promoting an album. But everyone else was like, 
I want to pick this song by the Beatles, or I want to pick this B-side or this music score oh, or man. anything. Oh, God, you're putting me on the spot there, aren't you? Simon chose Katie Musgraves. Did he? Yeah, which I was surprised by, but a really I've nice, smoky, beautiful, three-minute um, love song. So. Nightmare. Nightmare. Okay, I, you're going to have to cut this bit out while I find something. I always have to. Some people have took 20 minutes and emailed me, then text me, and I'm like, no, dude, like, one song. My heart thought when I was talking to you today, he's going to pick a Sabbath song. I thought. I mean, that's the obvious one, isn't it? Here is what it is. It's going to be Grounded by Pavement. Oh, I haven't heard Pavement for fucking ages. Yeah. I have a Pavement tattoo. They are. I have many, many all time favorite bands. Yeah. <laughs> they are one of them. <laughs> Didn't they play recently at a festival or they are playing a festival in the UK? Yeah, I'm they sure. played. They did a UK tour. I went to see yeah. them four times. Was it awesome? They were fucking unbelievable. Ugh. Better than they ever were in the 90s. Ugh, oh man. my God, I love them so much. <laughs> so why that song? Why is that one, do you think it came before any other? I don't know. I mean, I have, you know, there are some sort of God tier songs where yeah. you you choose your moment to listen to them because you don't want to wear the magic out of them. That's fair. Grounded is only three chords. It's in a really fucking weird tuning. It's got these weird chimey dissonant guitars. The lyrics, I don't know what the fuck it's about. <laughs> Gently sung. It's it, and then this this ripping fucking buzz saw guitar comes in. I it, 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 the tempo sways around. It's sometimes swung, sometimes straight. It's. I can see the fucking stars when there's a, there's a point in the golden section just as it hits the outro where my fucking heart skips a beat every single time. It's and I can't wait to listen to this it, after today's episode now because I'll edit it in. I put the whole track in, not just a snippet, so I can oh, then good, right. I'll have a whole fucking six weeks ahead of me now just listening to pavement again. Yeah, they, they, they when they kept, played their first UK show back, you know, in first time in like twelve, thirteen years. They walked on and I just saw Steve Martmus's hand go to a certain position on the guitar and my heart stopped. I was like, and it just they started playing that song. And I was just like, I, my fucking mouth was, my jaw was on the floor. I was crying my fucking eyes. I was like, this is happening now. It's your band playing that fucking song. It's just pure magic to me. I love it. I don't think I've, I've done now this for seven years. I don't think I've ever met anyone that's given me such a, sincere but genuine and just beautiful response to why a song because some people are like oh i got married to it lovely my kid was born to it lovely but it's in your blood i i, I, I ain't got any other interests man <laughs> no but it's <laughs> it's you that song is you and you got to hear it fucking live and you knew by the position of his fingers with a power chord or a certain chord that he was going to start that with that song and I don't know. I can't even imagine what the little hairs on your neck did that night. And yeah, there are there are there are certain. Sometimes, sometimes I'll dream that I'm a, I'm still at certain gigs in my life, and one of them is Faith No More in 1993 at the Phoenix Festival. I wow. still dream that I'm at that gig, and for many years, because pavement don't exist for the most part. So many times I dream that I'm watching Pavement play Grounded because it's just, it's my happy place, you know. You know Naomi that's... told me actually that um, you guys did a record show uh, store in America. And that's right, yeah. I think, I might be wrong, it was this or a festival around that date. And you met Mike Patton. That's correct, yeah. And she said it was your moment. She was like, oh, that's amazing. I've met, you know, the singer of Faith No More. What a legend. But she just took a step back and just, it was your moment. And I'm like, I hope that all roads eventually lead to me getting Mike Patton on this podcast. I think it will happen, but I just, I don't know how you even digested saying hello. Like where, where me and him are kind of in touch wow. very occasionally. Um, yeah, it's a long story, but Ocean Size supported Faith No More in 2009 once again, we supported them because I asked if it was if we could do it. Wow! And it came true. 
Um, and since then, we've just stayed in touch. Fucking, yeah. A lot of love for that fucking guy. You know, without Angel Dust, I'm absolutely nothing. It's just yeah, uh, the perfect album. And I can't imagine ever hearing a record that will ever fucking do to me what that record does every fucking time I put it on. I had it on last night. Um, I was obviously in an old school night last night, Black Sabbath. You were, pre- you were preparing for this podcast without Get it on, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I, he, he's, he's response. He's just, you know, he's just the best fucking vocalist, um, and a, and a, a great fucking map for what an artist should be. Are you, you going know? to the um, UK Mr. Bungle shows? Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's gonna be fucking amazing, and they're playing Download. I know. Yeah, I'm tempted to go to that just for that, just to see them, to be honest. But yeah, um, some good times ahead, I, dude. I know. Yeah, for real, man. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, we said before we started recording today that for some reason, I don't know why, two years ago you were meant to come on this podcast. Mm. Um, times were different. I think it was lockdown. I don't know what was going on, but it didn't happen. But I'm glad that it's happened now. So we've had more exciting and in incredible life experiences to share for real mark thanks so much for having me it's a, a real honor to have you all on the podcast but um oh i can't wait to see what they all said <laughs> well i'm gonna have to edit it because they're like oh he's a dickhead he sent us this <laughs> and his band were terrible and we just did it little prick. <laughs> yeah, they just told us that he was going to get us a sleep token tour one day so we went oh fuck it, yeah we'll do it <laughs> But thank you, dude. And uh, I know I'll see you guys soon. There'll be, I, I think Naomi was hinting that there's a couple of UK shows down the road. So, yeah, that's maybe. <laughs> You're the last to know. But when you are, I'll come and grab a beer and say hello. For real, Mark.